I wanted to introduce Cathy Malu, who is um, a visiting scholar at SOAS on a Fulbright. I think most of you know her. Uh, she's here for three months, um, and it's actually your last month now, or so the time is going very fast. Um, when she's not at SOAS, her normal job is in the US. She's at William Patterson University um, and is a professor of education in languages and literacy. She's worked extensively throughout Africa. Um, most of her work has been in the DRC and um, also in Rwanda, but also you've worked in South Africa, Guinea, um, so a range of countries. And I think we're going to hear about some of your experiences from DRC today. Um, so I'll pass over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming, and thank you for the invitation to let me present, and welcome to my presentation. Um, yes, I'll, 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 okay. Um, so let us, let us begin. Um, I just want to give a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about. I'll begin with a brief explanation of my background. I'll discuss the limitations that I believe I bring to the work that I'm doing. I'll also share some of the tentative research topics um, because this is a work in progress. I'm also going to present a brief historical overview of the DRC. And then I will share uh, a bit about my own classroom when I was in English as a foreign language teacher there in the 1970s. We will fast forward and um, meet that same classroom as, it, uh, as I saw it in 2014. And then I will be talking about English language clubs, that, that really should be English language clubs as opposed to English clubs. Um, I'll share some of the uh, survey uh, data uh, that I've gathered. Again, the limitations of what I believe my survey and other data represent, and a list of references. And um, let me say right now, the audience is very small, so I would appreciate uh, and encourage you to interrupt and um, let's have a, a, a give and take here. Um, we don't need to have it as formal as it might be were we in a big lecture hall. Um, OK, a little bit about my background. <clears throat> Um, let me begin in um, 1963, in the United States, uh, President Kennedy said to all, of, all Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And this was the impetus to create the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps is a voluntary organization that usually brings young Americans to developing countries to do all kinds of work. Um, some of it is teaching, it can be nursing, healthcare, community service. And um, I decided when I finished college to become a Peace Corps volunteer. I joined and I was sent to, at that time, Zaire, um, one of the other names for the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I worked there uh, for two years as an English as a foreign language teacher at an all girls secondary school uh, Catholic, and um, I'll be telling you a little bit more about that in a few more minutes. Um, I returned to the States, I got a master's degree in education, and five years later I rejoined the Peace Corps and was sent to Rwanda, where I became an, in an English language inspector and visited and uh, worked with some of the secondary school teachers. I also developed curriculum materials for teaching English in Rwanda. I came back to the States and I was a foreign language teacher, English and French, for about 20 years. And then I decided to get a PhD. And I got a PhD in language literacy and learning. Uh, I taught, uh, did teacher preparation for about 10 years and then I received my first Fulbright scholarship and I went to, I was sent to Rwanda where I was an English language um, teacher at the university level. So I prepared teachers in Rwanda just as I had been doing in the United States. Um, after that experience, I was offered a few positions, short-term positions with the United States Department of State and I was sent back to the Congo. Um, and I think you might be able to imagine what it was like for me um, having started my career in the Congo and as I approached the twilight of my career, I returned to the Congo. So it was quite an exciting experience for me. 
part of the work that I did in the Congo was to um, engage in a fact-finding mission to find out what people would like to talk about in English language clubs. And I used what I learned to create uh, handbooks that are, then, are now being used in the Congo uh, in the English language clubs. Based on that, um, those three trips, I developed the survey that I administered and gathered other data, which is part of the basis of, of my presentation today. Also, um, when I was uh, thinking about the work that I was doing with these um, English club materials, I found myself becoming uncomfortable with the work. I found myself asking, how many languages can we ask people to learn? And are my efforts really giving Congolese access to the international community? Am I really assisting them with their personal professional development? Or am I engaging in a new form of colonialism, linguistic colonialism? These were questions that troubled me and they, they continue to, to provoke lots of thoughts for me. Um, so, based on my brief background, uh, whoops, what happened here? How can I go back? Previous. Um, let, let me just talk briefly about the limitations that I, I bring. Um, first of all, my area is not linguistics. I am a teacher educator. Yes, I teach foreign languages, but my area really is teacher education, middle level um, education, classroom research, that kind of thing. So I acknowledge right from the get-go that I'm not a linguist. Um, I also have a lot of data that is personal. It's anecdotal. Um, yes, I've got survey data, but a lot of this comes out of my own personal experiences. Uh, I did some fact-finding <coughs> with, bless you, the um, people in the Congo, and I conducted uh, a survey and interview questions, but um, that is the limit of what I have in terms of my research. So what about some of the topics that I'm pursuing? What I'm really looking at are topics that have to do with the historical and contemporary nature of English language teaching and learning in the DRC. I'm also wondering about the data, the self-reported demographic and linguistic descriptions of the English language for English language learners. And I'm struggling with this notion of English language teaching and learning as emancipation or recolonization. So let me give you a, just a brief uh, overview of the Congo. Um, when I was thinking about uh, even applying to SOAS, at first I thought, well, maybe SOAS won't be interested because the Congo never came into their point of view. Um, the British had their own colonies, mm -hmm. and the Congo wasn't one of them. Um, and so maybe they won't be interested. Um, but then I thought, well, maybe they will be because you have not had a lot of contact with um, the Francophone world of Africa. So, um, as we know, um, the country borders of Rwanda were drawn. They were not determined based on any kind of linguistic or ethnic uh, borders. They were determined by a bunch of men sitting in uh, some place, probably in London, drawing and making decisions. For example, we know that uh, some of the languages in the Congo, Lingala, for example, is spoken on either side of the Congo River. Congo River is, is a border, a frontier, but that language and those, that ethnic group spans across. So, um, in terms of the uh, original people in the Congo, I went to the um, Congolese uh, embassy website uh, in, that's uh, for the UK, and I um, took directly from what they report. And there they said that the first inhabitants, they are calling them pygmies, and they were the farmers. In uh, 2000 BC to 500 AD, more of the um, Bantus came. The Bantus are considered also farmers, and they represented the broad linguistic languages of Lingala, 
Chuluba, and Swahili. In addition, in the eastern uh, part of um, the Congo, we have the influence from the East Africans, again Bantus, and those were predominantly herders, bringing with them the language of Kiswahili. And finally, we have the Hamites, who are also herders, who it is believed it, uh, it came into the Congo region from Darfur and from Ethiopia, also bringing Swahili. Um, as I did some of my preliminary research, I thought that it might be useful if I just create a chart with some of the dates and the important um, information uh, historically that had to do predominantly with language policy. The um, Congo Free State was created in 1885 based on the Conference of Berlin. And what I found most interesting, uh, particularly for people in the UK, is the fact that in 1904, the Congo Reform Association was created. This was a British-based association that was concerned with reporting out, letting the world know about the atrocities that were being committed in the Congo by and through the agency of King Leopold II. It was really based, and because of this Congo Reform Association, in the UK that eventually the Congo was removed from the control of King Leopold II and placed into the control of the Belgian government. There were not big changes that were made with that power shift, but there were some. And it's because of the Congo Reform Association that in 1908 the colonial charter was created which gave um, the Congo to the Belgian government and the Belgian government called it the Belgian Congo. Um, over the years in the early 1900s there were influences from the Flemish side. Um, some of them were quite nationalistic and they believed that there should be the um, equal opportunity for the use of Flemish as well as French in the Congo. The minister of the colonies, Louis Frank, also felt the same way. Um, and that influence uh, was felt um, in the 1950s when um, bilingualism was, uh, became a language policy. Bilingualism did not mean with African languages, it meant with Flemish and French. Um, one other item that I found particularly disturbing from my point of view as an American was that the um, in 1920, we saw the influence of the Phelps Stokes Fund. This was an American-based fund uh, which um, focused on racist, ethnocentric um, philosophies and had a tremendous influence on some of the things that were going on uh, in the Belgian Congo. In 1960, we know that the Congo became independent and 1965 to 1997 was the reign of the dictator Mobutu. Let's look now at a little bit more specific, in a little bit more specific detail about the language policies shortly before independence and through to the time that I came into the Congo. As you can see from this chart, there was a huge amount of movement in terms of language policy shifting from medium of instruction, which at some points were Congolese languages, at other points were French, and there was this backwards and forwards kind of movement which gave no kind of consistency to the policies and practices in the Congo in terms of the languages that were used. Fast forward now to 1971 and my time in the Congo, which was 1973. So as I told you, um, I can speak now from personal experience about this English language teaching and learning and the practices that went on. These practices depended on, in large part, the geographical location of the school, the school budget, access to teaching materials, whether or not the schools had access to those, 
the teacher training, how well or poorly the teachers were trained, and the teacher's knowledge of the languages that they were expected to speak. In my case, I taught at an all-girls Catholic boarding school. It was on a paved road 90 minutes outside the, the capital city of Kinshasa. The nuns were extremely conscientious about making sure that we had everything that we needed and that they followed the language policies to the letter because they were always easy targets for the language inspectors. It was always easy for them to hop on the road and come out to inspect the school. So the nuns were pretty careful about what they were doing. So here I've got um, two photographs from my teaching time there. On the left is a photograph of the 11th grade class. There were 25 students in that class. And on the right is a photograph of the, of the um, ninth grade classroom. Um, there were 35 students in that classroom. Um, the angle of my camera doesn't allow you to see the entire classroom, but believe me, there were 35 <laughs> students, which felt like a pretty, pretty big, um, pretty big classroom. Um, I, I'm sorry? Are you in the photo? I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there I am. Um, photography um, at that time in the Congo was, was a very, very tricky thing because Mobutu had a policy that no photographs were allowed to be taken. And so I, when I started looking back, I found that I had very, very few photographs. Um, so the, these are, these are quite, precious, quite precious for me. Um, as I said, I had everything that I needed. I had textbooks for all four grade levels that I taught. All my students had textbooks. Each one of them had a textbook. They all had um, cahiers, their notebooks. They all had pens, paper, pencils, rulers, erasers. I had a blackboard, chalk. I had everything, unlike some other Peace Corps volunteers who had very, very little. Uh, some of them were teaching in situations where they didn't even have blackboards. Um, so um, while I was there in 1973 to 75, there took place a quite famous world event, which was the uh, heavyweight boxing champion uh, bout between uh, George Foreman and Muhammad Ali. And um, for some reason, even to this day, I, I can recite for you the chant that people would say, which was Ali Bumaye, Ali Bumaye, which in Lingala meant kill him, Ali, just kill him. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I took this photograph in 2014 when I returned, um, and it is a um, photograph that is stating that they are going to um, pay, um, have a, a, a um, commemoration for 40 years uh, after, after the fight with Muhammad Ali. Um, so my, um, as I said before, my return to the Congo was something that I really couldn't imagine. Um, it seemed like I, it brought my professional um, experience, experiences kind of full circle. And um, the other thing that I was able to do was to return to the school where I had been working and um, I was able to see what was going on there. I found that the classrooms had different colored paint on the walls and that there were very few students in the classroom. On the left is a photograph of the 11th grade classroom and there were enough uh, seats for just 16 students. On the right is the 12th grade classroom, an English language classroom, and not much different from when I was a teacher, except that there were only enough desks for 10 students, which meant that the classes had become much, much smaller. Um, you can't see um, through on the PowerPoint, but uh, you might be able to make out that here we've got a verb conjugation. The verb to eat is conjugated in the simple present tense, and over here we have the rule for the use of the simple, um, present, simple present continuous tense. So the form of instruction was the old kind of grammar translation instruction that, that continues to be used. 
Um, I asked about the low number of students in the classroom, and I was told that now families have many more choices for where they can send their young girls, and so that's one of the reasons why the enrollment is now so low. Um, I want to turn my attention now to focus on my tentative research project, these English language clubs. And this was done through my work in 2014 and 2015. I found that there's a grassroots movement that seems to be sweeping across the Congo. There's an effort by the local population who want to practice English, the English that they have been learning in schools and secondary schools. They study English for four years at the secondary level, and depending on their major, they'll study it also at the university. This practice, however, is sporadic, irregular, and erratic, and it depends on the geographical location of the school, the availability of materials, the school budget, and the teacher training and conscientiousness of the school to access whatever it is that they need. The reasons for students wanting, or for people, the general public, wanting to learn English are similar to many of the reasons given in the language policy decisions that I've been reading about. They want to join the international community, and they don't believe that it, French is going to give them access to that. So, what goes on in English language clubs? On my visit to the Congo, I stopped at 15 clubs, and I attended a meeting at each one of the club, at each one of the clubs. Um, in this photograph, we have one English language club where two presenters are talking and telling the club members how to prevent the spread of Ebola. The presentation is being given in English, and afterwards there was a discussion. On the right, this is an English club that is taking place in the English language classroom uh, run by the U.S. Embassy. You can see that we have um, gender balance, we have co-presidents, a man and a woman, and they are talking with the members of the English language club. There are about 50 members in the uh, English language club that's based at the embassy, and in this club there are more than 100 members. So, uh, one of the most favorite events in the club are the participation by the audience and the skits, dramas, uh, music that's sung that are presented to the group. Um, afterwards, the club members usually talk about what they've seen. The skits are usually focused on uh, romantic uh, problems and um, have to do with husband-wife relations or um, uh, young men and young women relations. And um, what I want to share for you is a video clip from one of the clubs. It's a neighborhood club. It meets twice a month in one of the classrooms in one of the local elementary schools. There are at least 15 members in this club, the African Academy. Okay, the clip that I'm going to show you is about a wife, a young woman who comes to see her pastor, and she is telling him that she's there because her husband doesn't want her to work at her job anymore. He's jealous. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so problem of jealousy, problems between the husband and wife, jealousy about the wife working outside the home. Okay, I have another clip that I'd like to show you, and it's from the White House English Club. And um, 
I think that I don't need to say too much more about the CLIP. Let me just tell you that the, this club meets every week after their Sunday religious service. There are more than a hundred members in the club, and I think you'll figure out for yourselves what this CLIP is about. examples of the many different things that go on in the English clubs. Okay. Um, one other thing that I wanted to share with you was something that I found a little bit um, surprising. Uh, and I'll, I'd be curious to hear any ideas that you might have about this. Um, as I told you, I visited the websites for the Congolese Embassy um, in the United States and also in London. Here is a screenshot of the um, Congolese Embassy website in the United States. And this is the one in the UK. I was a bit puzzled because, um, as you can see, the first lines are translated, and then everything else is in English. French. 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 I'm, I'm sorry, French, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, two English-speaking countries, but one country has an a, um, English website and the other country has the website in French. I don't have any way to explain it. I wonder if anybody does. <laughs> why, does it list, why does it say list of passports? Yes, what happens when you click? Uh, when you click, then I think that it lists all the passports that have received their, the visas. Oh, okay. And so if you need to pick up your, your passport, um, you just look for your name and it's, it, you've got your visa there. So there are not, that's two websites for London and... This one's London this, and the other yeah. one's the US. How do I but go? I'm wondering whether there's... That's the US the, website. I've got you. I'm just reiterating in words rather than pictures. Um, in European uh, websites for the missions in the European countries, what language is it in? I'm wondering. I'm not answering your yeah, 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 yeah. puzzle, but what other is it in, in in Oslo? Is it in Norwegian or whatever? I don't know. That's a good question. I I I, I should look to see. <laughs> but. So I, Why? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I just kind of throw that the out there. Was it the ambassador's decision? But you've also got this information under in the red, in the black box. It says read more in English. It doesn't actually say laissez. That could be a function of having access to it through an English language course. Or mm. Okay. It's um, not bilingual in the English one, is it? Uh, 
I, I couldn't find um, anything uh, bilingual on that site, right. but um, when I scrolled down, uh, and I it had history, people, culture, and then business, and when I clicked on business, it took me to articles that were written in English. But everything else, the culture, language, you know, the information I shared at the beginning in the overview, that, that was all in French. So. But these are now to collect your passports, like if you're requesting a visa. So mm -hmm. it's British people wanting to go. I, I think British or, or whatever. Congolese, but it's anyone. not that it's like serving only the Congolese. It's, um, yeah. it's for everybody. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we do learn French as like a second language in schools, but that doesn't put, like you know it doesn't mean that we all would speak French fluently. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I want to um, share with you now is information about the survey that I conducted, and um, perhaps you can give me some of your ideas about um, what I might be able to do with it. So based on my three recent trips to the Congo, I designed and administered a survey and I conducted open-ended interviews with individuals and with focus groups. Um, I am a qualitative researcher and I feel like a fish out of water with some of this. I have 41 participants who completed paper copies of my survey in the Eastern Congo. I have 92 participants who completed paper copies of the survey in Kinshasa, the capital. I have 22 participants who completed papers uh, copies of the survey in the rural part of the Congo, in central Congo. And then I have 134 participants who completed online copies of the survey. I think I have a lot of descriptive statistical data. So the categories of data that I have include demographic information, age, gender, education, career profession, formal English language education, number of years that people have studied, where they studied in school or university, informal English language learning experiences, whether they're in English clubs or elsewhere. I have self-reports about their knowledge of English, the African languages they speak, and French. And I also have data that, talks, that gives me information about their opinions about the importance of English, the roles and skills of their English teachers, the role of English in their lives, and English club activities. I also conducted um, open-ended interviews and there were open-ended questions for the participants to answer at the end of the survey and the topics included the benefits to participation in the clubs, the problems with participation, the reasons they attended the clubs, what was enjoyable or not, suggested activities that they wanted to have done, and then I had a other space where they could add more information. Um, based on what I've shared so far, I wonder if, if there's anything here that strikes you, um, if there's any ideas that you have about what I might be able to do with this data. Um, I, I, this is about all that I have. I haven't started analyzing the data now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that is the slide good, you wanted? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to get my head around the, the stuff you're mapping there. Uh -huh. Just exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the open-ended questions were just the ones on the second slide, right? Yes. These were all the, and this, this, these were basically, yeah, you know, take, how old are yeah. you? Would tick off boxes put circles around, you know, uh, my knowledge of English, I think I, very well, poor, that kind of thing. So why did you do this research? Um, I did the research. It, it grew out of my assignment to go and uh, identify topics and then write up materials for English language clubs. And while I was there, I said to myself, my goodness, I have this huge number of participants you know, maybe I should create a survey and give it to them, um, which is what I did, um, which also becomes part of the limitations of this. I didn't go specifically to administer a survey and to gather this data, but it 
came up as I was in the process of um, doing this other work. It seems to me like there, there could be some useful information here, but um, we, I'm not quite sure. Can we sure. draw out of it what, how people knew that they had this opportunity to join the clubs? <clears throat> and that wasn't one of the questions that I we asked. Can't, it isn't? Or it, it, it was not, no. Can we draw out of it? I, I that believe that we, that we can, um, based on their opinions yeah. about the importance of English and the role of English. Yeah. Um, that they, and I'm curious to know what it is that motivates people to do anything. To do, do so join the English why, language yeah, clubs. Why mm -hmm. they would, took it at school if they had the option mm -hmm. not to. Mm -hmm. um, why they continued with it. Yes, they yes, could. yes. Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? You why? Give why? it time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. effort. Right. Right. Exactly. I I was puzzled too. I mean, it's a lot of time and effort, but they. They were, every club that I visited, they were really enthusiastic. Um, the U.S. Embassy had um, a workshop for the English language club leaders, and that was where I got the um, 292 uh, um, participants, uh, because they had 200 come to that one-day workshop. It's extremely popular in, in Quito, in Ecuador, too. Okay. By the U.S. Embassy, and I don't know why there. Uh-huh, mm. uh-huh. <coughs> I, I, uh, from, from anecdotal evidence, not yet having looked in, the, in this data, um, people would tell me that they just feel like French is no longer useful. You go look on the internet and you don't find a lot of websites that are in French. Everything is in English. Um, yes. And also that perhaps that formal learning opportunities aren't adequate mm -hmm. and they need extra practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I think that they, they want to expand um, their knowledge of English. Um, they also said that it felt like it, it would give them access to a more global uh, world, a more global community. Um, there were groups, uh, hospitals had English language clubs, uh, churches, as I showed you the Michael Jackson clip was was done at a church, had English language clubs, um, professional lawyers and people like that would would create clubs, uh, taxi drivers had English clubs. <laughs> and the, the idea being particularly uh, in Kinshasa, um, Bukavu in the east where there might be reasons for tourists to come, they felt like they'd be better able to um, engage and, and help tourists. Hotels would have English language clubs, so it's um, it's it's really really interesting for me. When when did it all start with the English language club? So it wasn't there in the seventies when you were there. No, I I didn't hear yeah. about anything so like that. So how did it? Because it's obviously grown and spread. Uh -huh, how, uh -huh. how did it all begin? Um, I I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I I I I might guess that maybe there were some schools that had English language clubs after schools, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe some of the, well, it's been, um, I think most of the Peace Corps left in 1995, say, so it's been, what, 20 years since they, any of that influence is there, but uh, maybe, maybe, if they, any of the Peace Corps volunteers had clubs that, that they wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. Could you move to the mother, next sure. slide again? And Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, do you look at what the British Council does? Um, I'm aware that the British Council is quite active in some of this, um, but I haven't uh, done any kind of systematic uh, examination of what the British Council does. I don't know. But I know they're quite active. Yeah. I don't really know what they do either. Mm -hmm. Except that they promote people, they offer people traineeships, they offer actually some versions of bursaries or scholarships for people to become good teachers of English as a second language for people who intend to live in a non-English speaking country. Mm -hmm. um, now, still, as you go on their website, you'll find options to apply for such things. And people from South Asia that I've known <coughs> gravitated to the British Council to improve their English. Um, to be around people mm -hmm. that spoke mm -hmm. English well. Mm -hmm. um, 
and to hear the radio programs and, and it was, I don't know that they were exactly clubs, but mm -hmm. they were clubby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there, um, I read one study uh, that developed, I think it was, it's in Malawi, um, English language teaching materials using British Council um, materials. Uh, and when I was in Rwanda in 2014, 2010, um, the British Council was extremely active. Um, and they were bringing in English language teachers into the country to teach at the schools and also to do what I was doing, help with teacher preparation in the area of English. Uh, I yes, think it's please. interesting how you said um, lawyers and so on, professionals also attend these clubs. Yes. So that's suggesting to me that it's not just Afri poor Africans were wanting to kind of better their English. So then what's, like she said, what's behind? The, is it more to do with the cultural the aspirations of the English way of life or seeing English as this sort of global, you know, super... Uh -huh. I, I, it's some of the conversations that I had, it was the idea that English is going to get us someplace, you know, forget French now, forget the French it, yeah. are, it, it's, it's it, not, not meaning the people, the British people, but the English language. If we know in the English language, we're going to have many more opportunities. Okay, so it's not just the Britishness kind of element. No. So it's just English language. Right, yeah, yeah, it's the English language. I'm quite sure that the adults I was teaching English in a place called Asylum Access Ecuador, mm -hmm. where everybody in the class was a refugee of some sort, mm -hmm. um, according to the South American definition of that, which is different to the UN definition, but that's teasing out the law a little bit. Anyway, people seeking refuge and um, they saw English as the language of commerce. So if they needed, their intention to learn English was associated with their intention to start the business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean it's the only reason. Okay, yeah. that's, that, that's what, it's yeah. like anecdotal, mm -hmm. that's what I know yeah. motivated some yeah. of them. And then there were <coughs> mothers and children who just felt that their children, it was an opportunity for children to learn mm -hmm. something useful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, um, as with everything, individual people have their different reasons and motivations, but, you know, if it, there can be a way to identify what some of those principal ones are that might be, might be useful. Um, okay, um, let me um, just reiterate some of the um, limitations that I believe exist in this kind of survey uh, data uh, interviews and focus groups. Um, from my perspective, obviously my ethnicity, my age, my gender, I think may um, impact on um, the data that I gathered. Uh, my, my knowledge, I have knowledge there, but I should say my lack of knowledge of any of the um, languages spoken in the Congo, except for very brief phrases of greetings and things like that. Um, my, my lack of a kind of in-depth or a deep understanding of the various cultures there, um, I, w I wonder about the role that my name, my last name plays. It's an um, ethnic name that is easily recognized, belonging to one particular group. Um, the survey design, the fact that um, I kind of did this after the fact. Uh, the fact that it was hard copy had its own parameters of limitations, as did the online. Uh, the timing of my work, uh, there was very little time to kind of really pilot the survey and test it out. Um, and the planning of the whole study was kind of haphazard, kind of after the fact. So um, for, for my point of view, I'm mindful of, of these as limitations. One of the other questions that I have for, for all of you is, um, as I said, I'm not a linguist. This is not my area of expertise. So I've been, part of my time here at SOAS has been to do as much reading as I can. And I have a, a list of references that I have read, but I wonder if there are references that you think I need to read that need to be included. Are there names of classic people, people who you'd say are, you know, classic 
thinkers in the field that I don't have here. I can email you the name of a person who gave the lecture. She was employed by SOAS and she was doing an um, in-house professional development class for okay. teachers here okay. recently. It's a pity you missed it. But anyway, it's all on video, but also... Oh, lovely. So you can hear what she said, which is really... She is a linguist. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, let me get my pen. Just yeah. If I can take your sure, address, sure. I'll send you the link for the video. Sure. And who is that? Her name. I don't even know it. <laughs> she was, was in the she's Czech. Oh, Alina. Sounds oh, right. Alina. Uh, yeah. I, I was able to um, I was able to attend her. Oh, you did. Yes, yes. So yes, wasn't that, that inspiring? Very, very so interesting. I'm just getting you don't need to. Thank you. Yeah, but I had my That's contact information here. I don't. Yeah. Do, you, do you know someone? What is your surname? Yeah, I was also thinking of saying Kokke. No. He's a Congolese linguist. He's in Chicago. Why did you ask Thank you. her, Kathleen? Don't you think she would know someone? Yes, I can also I can also ask her. That's a good suggestion. Uh, she's also Catherine Wallace. She's based at the Institute of Education across the road. Catherine Wallace? Okay. She's there. She's, 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 she's the second, third, last person. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. I mean, she's actually here. If you oh, want to okay. Talk to her. Oh, okay. Okay. Not, not good. Not here, but across the road. Okay. <laughs> and who? <laughs> <laughs> who was? Who was the other person you said was the Congolese? Sunny Coco Mufwene. Coco Mufwene. Sunny Coco Mufwene. Sunny Mufwene is the same. In Chicago. Yeah. Okay. Not, not, not a, and nothing to do with education or whatever. Uh huh. Yeah, we uh -huh. some things like linguistic ecology. Okay. Um, yeah, interesting person anyway. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's you know, a totally new field for me, so I'm kind of uh, trying to find my way, so. There's another lady who taught me philosophy last year, Bernadette La Franchi, from Key, Franchi. And she may have left SOAS um, and be somewhere else, but she's studying African philosophies and also Hana, bringing it together with Hana Arendt. She's young and extraordinary. Um, and who's the man? Oh, the Italian man around who teaches philosophies. Does anybody know? But she was kind of his protege. He's Cosimo Zene. Cosimo So, Bernadetta La Franchi, all one word. Thank you. I'm sorry, yeah. No, that's all right. She's, if, she's in Birmingham. Is she? Mm. Okay, well, that's helpful. Emma, have I got her name right? Yes. <laughs> there you go. So, okay. she's very Thank you. Um, deep into her subject. but. It may, and it may overlap. She's interested in African philosophy. That's what okay. she really wants. Uh -huh. Okay. And I don't know what her languages are, but it, her English is almost impeccable. <laughs> um, and her Italian is native, so more than that. Okay. Like, and her philosophy is fine. Even and more than the other. Another, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> another question I'll ask you is if you can think of a publication venue that might be interested in something like this. Do you know the British Association of Applied Linguistics Language in Africa Special Interest Group? Um, I think that that was okay. the, the okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, you're, be, you're involved in that, obviously. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, the, uh, and, and they, I don't know what, what they publish. I, I'm only peripherally involved. I know a uh, person who organizes it, uh, Goody Thwaite, if you're interested. Okay, okay. The other one, I think, I, I, and I can give you a copy of this, but it's also available online, so I can send you a link. Oh, lovely. Uh, there's been a British Council study of um, language education in Africa. Okay. Um, they've also done one in Pakistan, which uh, basically both of them are interesting and similar in yeah. a way. Um, but he's saying, don't go for English. <laughs> mm, <yeah. laughs> okay, great. That would, that would be great. It might be Sargent. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, but I, I've got a, a paper copy because we had a talk by Goodith White and, and um, 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 and they published in that book of, of, of chapters. Um, 
some time ago now, and the British Council printed a whole load of copies that were misprinted. They didn't have anything on the spine, so they just made oh. a box for Oh, wow. <laughs> so I think I would still have a few if you want one. <laughs> oh, I'd love one. I'd love one. <laughs> okay, okay, great, great. Um, well, uh, I do want to thank you for your attendance, and uh, <laughs> I'm open to any further questions, discussion, conversation, chatting. And there are also drinks and dinner afterwards if anyone wants to chat. <laughs> I had a question about the textbooks. Are they where are they developed? Are they from the UK, US, or are they locally developed? Or um, which textbooks are the you ones talking? that they use in the schools? Okay, so the ones, oops, the ones that we used in 1973 were published by um, we called them Cartledge, uh, I believe it was Longman, and they were the title was went something like English for Francophone Africa or English for French speaking Africa, um, and. You know, I remember very distinctly in year two, I was supposed to teach about the locks along the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh -huh. And I was supposed to teach about hot and cold running water faucets <laughs> and all of these things that just had no connection to the environment and where I was. Um, today, uh, there were no books in the classrooms that I visited, uh, so I don't know um, what's being used mm -hmm. in the in the government run in the government run classrooms. Yeah. yeah. But that's interesting that in the seventies, even though these textbooks were specifically for Francophone countries, that still the topics were. Yes. Now, some of the topics were interesting and relevant, uh, particularly in the last two years. Uh, of, of education, uh, they had a couple of folk tales, they had some short stories, um, there was uh, the, um, what is it, the Mountains of the Moon, a story about King Solomon's Mines, uh, things like that, but um, still they were mixed in with, you know, other things that mm -hmm. I, I just had a hard time figuring out how, how to make them relevant for the learners in my, in my classroom. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, how are you um, perceived as a, let's say, as a white American woman? Yeah. How did the uh, students interact with you and how did they perceive you? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. For example, the traditional African disciplinary system of whipping the child and all this kind of, I don't know how you managed to. <laughs> yeah, around, around. Well, well, I, I, I have uh, two different stories to tell. Oh, right. um, so in the, in the 1970s, um, first of all, I was a new teacher. I, I hadn't any experience in teaching in the United States anywhere. So, so uh, there I was in the Congo trying to be a teacher and confronting cultural differences. Um, the nuns had um, very tight control on what, what was going on. And so if I had any disciplinary problems, I would tell them and they would speak with the students. I never saw anybody being hit uh, or reprimanded in that way. There was always the conversation or the discussion. But I remember speaking with someone and I said, expressing my frustration, you know, I don't know why they're not listening to me. And this person said, well, now listen, you're a young woman, you're not married, and you don't have children. And, you know, what do you expect? So when I returned and I was teaching in Rwanda, now granted a different, different country, different ethnic group, I expressed to someone how things were going so well at the university, students were listening to me and I was so pleased. And then I repeated this story of what happened to me. And I said, and so now I have gray hair, I have children, and <laughs> this must be really working. Oh. And the professor said back to me, the Rwandan professor, oh no, madame, that doesn't work anymore. Nobody cares about the old people. All we care about now is the younger generations. So I felt like I was, you know, missing the boat <laughs> every, every moment wherever I went. Um, but. Yes, the problems that I had with discipline in the Congo, I, I 
you know, I, I would have had similar problems in the United yeah. States. They, they, it hadn't, I, I'm pretty much convinced it, it was my, my problems with teaching it, and not necessarily my, my, um, my language. Um, one other thing that, that you might find interesting is that um, with my work in Rwanda, the students would joke at me whenever I started talking about literature and um, we're going to be talking about British literature now and they would all start laughing and um, if I wanted to uh, wake them up I would say well now we're going to talk about British literature and then, then they would <laughs> they always kept saying oh madame your your mouth is so garbled with the way you speak American English <laughs> so um, is that uh, American English or British is there one that they prefer my sense was that they really preferred the British English okay. because they could understand it better. Yeah. More, I, it was clearer for them. Uh, many told me that they loved my accent, but you know, I, I was the teacher and I was giving grades, so <laughs> I'm realistic about what students tell me sometimes. So. I thought your diction was beautifully clear, in spite of being American <laughs> English, actually. Well, just your frankly, handicap, yeah. yeah. What? In spite of handicap. Yes, yes. In spite of the fact that, I, that English is my second language, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I was going to ask just one more com well, um, point. I don't know um, what she's written much. Anna Disley. Um, when you said Mountains of the Moon, she's worked in the Mountains of the Moon. Um, okay. Um, she may be behind some of those materials. Okay. I S L E I. She is again in the British Association, the Special Language in Africa group. Okay. Um, but okay. she's uh, also had a lot of experience teaching English, I think, um, anyway, so she might be an interesting person for you to talk to. Okay. Where, where, where she is at the moment, I have no idea. <laughs> Um, okay. But, no, uh, Catherine Wallace, I, I really, that would be lovely if I could meet her. She, she may have retired, I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Um, but she was based across the road in the Institute okay. of Education. Okay, okay. Yeah, that would be great. She may well keep, and, and there may well be other people there. Mm -hmm. um, they're obviously specialists in education, they do right. a lot of things like development education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so go and chat, just go and chat there. Sure, 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 sure. Thank you. And your name is, I'm I'll Julia, tell them. Julia Salabank. Julia Salabank. So I'll tell I'll them you sent me. With some of this stuff. Lovely. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll be using my SOAS email address um, as long as I can. Mm -hmm. I, I need to check to see if I can extend my my use of that email address. I don't know yeah. that that will be possible or not. I was I wanted to ask you two things. No one else minds. I wanted to ask you one about the business about. Is it cultural imperialism, or are we helping yes. people? I think that's a yes. really interesting topic. Yes. And also, can you tell us more about what you're doing here at SOAS? Okay. Um, I, do you mind if I sit? We can make this Please. a little more chatty and uh, informal. I hope this doesn't disturb the videography. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the first question was? Um, the, 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 the issue you mentioned at the beginning. Oh, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Imperialism yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't have an answer for that. I, I don't, I, I, I don't know. The British Council report I mentioned is trying to address as well. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And they obviously feel very guilty about it. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you know, I met people who, for example, um, had moved from one province to another, and so they learned Swahili in the street, playing with their friends, but they would go home and they would speak Chaluba to their parents and eventually they couldn't speak Chaluba but they could understand it. So they, the parents would speak Chaluba, the children would speak to the parents in Swahili. And then with Mobutu's impact, Lingala was quite prominent and then people moved to Kinshasa where Lingala was spoken. And then they had to learn French and then they were learning English. And I, I mean, how many languages can you ask it, um, someone to learn? I mean, it's... Infinity. Um, have uh, you talked to our colleague Friedrich Lubke? No. She is running a, a project on multilingualism in Senegal, um, particularly looking at this issue of people speaking lots of languages, people mm -hmm. shifting from language to mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. as, as needed, etc. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh. Yeah, it might be useful. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's, it's just mind-boggling to me, really. 
Um, so what I'm doing at SOAS is I'm basically doing research. Um, I've got a, you know, a, a library card and then um, access to um, the internet SOAS library database online. And I've been doing a lot of reading and, and writing and thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the first opportunity I had to meet anyone was at the department meeting uh, last week. Okay. Um, Sheena ha has been very helpful in uh, checking in with me to be sure I don't need anything. Uh, but other than that, I've been feeling a little bit. Uh, <laughs> okay. it's, it's a pity that we didn't really know about because uh, when Luke sent around this thing introducing you, I thought it was the beginning of your stay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> and I've been on sabbatical anyway. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Well, it, the other thing is that it's, it's a, it is a very short time, mm -hmm. three months. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for every day of it, but um, three months really goes quite fast. Maybe what I needed to do was set things up, you know, before I came rather than wait until I, I got here to, to um, be in touch. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You talk to our colleagues um, who teach World Englishes as well. I, I uh, met somebody at the um, reception in the Brunei Gallery when they were mm -hmm. showing the, uh, the new exhibit for the centenary, but uh, nothing formal. So Anne Powers would be yeah. someone. Yeah. Um, she's in linguistics, but yeah, does um, yes. global Englishes. Yes. She would be an excellent content because she's also been on research herself on language maintenance. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Seraphine Camden is the other one that teaches on that, I think. Yeah. Okay. okay. Not Camden as in this area. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Well, you're. You know, certainly welcome to email me if you have any ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Any other <coughs> questions, comments? If anyone wants to email Kathy, um, we can give you the email address at the end. Um, so if you have any more, I mean, Julia has it, but maybe the two of you don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, I, I also have it on my handout okay, at the bottom. Perfect. So yeah, if you have any suggestions, it would be great if you can email. Um, and I think we'll end here, but thank you, Kathy, very much oh, for this you informative much. talk, really interesting. Uh, so maybe we can just give a round of applause. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who are